Thank you so much, Felipe and Sergio, for that amazing, amazing song. <clears throat> I'd like to start with a story. The building was ready. The paint had dried. Turquoise burlap covered the various bulletin boards. It was time for my Uncle Steve to unlock the doors for the first time at the Loud Cried Mission he and some others started in West Sacramento. They had no formal support and prayed for every penny that came in. He sat at his desk, frozen with fear. Most of the people that would come to frequent the mission were homeless or lived in tiny rundown shacks in the neighborhood. Nearly all of them were alcoholics. On the, other, on the other hand, my uncle had never drunk a drop of alcohol, nor had a desire to do so. He knew he had a call to do this work, but he couldn't bring himself to open the door. How, how could he reach these people that he was afraid to speak to? He wasn't sure he could care for them. Then a scripture came to his mind. It's as much as you have done to the least of these, my brethren, you have done unto me. He went ahead and opened the door. They fed the people breakfast every morning and an early dinner in the afternoon. One day, the mission ran out of coffee. This is what happened in my uncle's own words. All we had was the seven cups of the previous day's coffee still in the pot. The stores were not open yet, and it was a very cold day. Besides that, we had no money and no one was awake that might have felt impressed to give us some. It was a 30-cup coffee pot. I filled the pot to the top and prayed, God, you turned water into wine. Can you please turn this water into coffee so we could help warm these people up? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I just ask that you be with us today. Open our hearts to the message that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll finish that story later. <clears throat> but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Why do I love this church? I was raised by the church and grew up in Adventist schools from first grade all the way through my doctorate. I want you to know how this church and school invested in me. I was only a child with very little to offer. <clears throat> my mom was separated from my dad. She took, a, she took a little break from church, but knew that it was important for my brother and I to go to Sabbath school. So she would drop us off and then go to Denny's to have a cup of coffee and wait for Sabbath school to be over so she could pick us up. Meanwhile, in my Adventist school, I'm learning from my first grade teacher how bad coffee is. I got so scared thinking my mom would die because of her addiction that I came home and cried to my mom until she quit. From that day on, my mom became a Roma drinker. <clears throat> I also kept nagging my mom about her skipping church. You go everywhere else, why can't you come back to church? So me, a first grader, led my mom back to church. And a little child shall lead them. My dad was not around a lot. <clears throat> and he was not an Adventist. So there was a lot of things my brother and I lacked without having a father around. One was knowing how to tie a tie. I still don't know how to tie a tie. <clears throat> So every week, one of our Sabbath school leaders, one of our friend's dad, would tie my brother's tie as if my brother was his own son. I shared this with his daughter recently, who lost her father years ago, and she was moved to tears. My brother and I had a lot of surrogate fathers who stepped into our lives growing up in Sacramento. One such person was our previous high school Bible teacher, Mr. Bartlett. <clears throat> He, is, he was just such a father figure, and he still is for me today, and happens to be here now ministering to your high school students. I remember how hard it was for my mom, year after year, to go to the financial advisor to beg him to allow my brother and I to register for school. Some of you can relate. 
even though we had not finished paying our bill for the year before. Some of you can relate to that too. Yet somehow, every year, my brother and I were registered. When I graduated from high school, in order to get my diploma and to be able to get my transcripts for college, my entire debt was placed on my brother's bill. That year, my brother registered for school, and every time my mom received a bill, she saw that it said that the balance was zero. When I asked my mom about this story recently, she corrected this by telling me that actually, the bill showed that she had a credit. This confused and bothered her, so after a while, she went and asked, what is going on? By some mistake, my brother was never officially registered. So though he received his grades and was seen as a student, he was not being charged tuition. The miracle is when the mistake was caught that the decision made by the financial advisor and the principal was to forget the debt. That debt would include not just my brother's, but mine as well. The principal's daughter, Mrs. Johnson, is a middle school teacher here at Fleece and my close friend. I've heard that many of you in this church have similarly showed your generosity and love by supporting kids through the years with their Christian education. What you have sacrificed truly makes a difference in the lives of those students. I'm a witness to this. I learned to trust God with my whole heart that day because I understood that God cared about every detail of my life. <clears throat> I'm here today because of God's provision for my life through those who invested in me. There's one more person who invested in me that I want to tell you about. This was my Sabbath school leader, Mrs. Ashley. When I was mid-college, I came home from break, and I came to my home church, and I told her, thank you for all you did to invest in me and so many others. She responded, don't thank me, Sonia. Go and do it for someone else. That challenge has stuck with me and is a big reason why I do what I do. Why would all these and countless others invest in me, an insignificant female, a mere child? Well, maybe they had chosen to follow Jesus' example and invest in people he invested in. Remember our focus text. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. Who were often considered the foolish and the weak in biblical culture? In the Old Testament, we read a story about a young shepherd boy who picks up five stones and takes down a giant, and also a young orphan queen, Esther, who saves an entire nation by risking death and going to a king to plead for mercy when her predecessor lost her throne by speaking up to the same king. We also hear about Naaman's young maid, we don't even know her name, who advises her master to go see a prophet, Elisha, to be healed from leprosy. Did you hear what I said? A young maid, whose name is not even important enough to mention, advises a commander in the army to go see a king, to get permission to go see a prophet in the town where she was captured from in order to be healed. In the New Testament, we can read stories of all the people that Jesus hung out with, people he invested in, and people who invested in him. This included women and children. In John chapter 11, we learn that Jesus loves Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. How amazing to have that mentioned specifically. You're loved by Jesus. These were his friends, who are more like family, if you know what I mean. And now Jesus' friend Lazarus has died. He mentions this to his disciples, and in the most pastoral way he can, he says that Lazarus has gone to sleep. And his disciples respond, good, then he'll get better. So Jesus explains plainly, Lazarus is dead. When Jesus finally gets there, Martha hears Jesus is coming and goes out of the house to meet him. Jesus chooses to break open the bread, the deep theology of death and resurrection with this mere woman. She says, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. 
Yes, Martha said. He will rise when everyone else rises at that last day. I wonder from where and from whom she might have learned that from before. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, and the one who has come into the world from God. Then in John 12, 3 to 8, we hear about how her sister Mary, at a party honoring Jesus, prepares Jesus for his burial by anointing him with her tears and expensive nard. This was the perfume whose scent would be fresh in his mind and on his body days later when he was dying on the cross as a testimony of at least one person who loved him extravagantly. This same Mary was mentioned by Luke in Luke 10, 38 to 42 where Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet. The place that in Jesus' day was taken by disciples who would follow a particular rabbi for a great portion of their life until they could take over for that rabbi. When Mary sat at Jesus' feet, this is how she would have been seen, as a student at a rabbi's feet. Then when Martha complains about her, I love Jesus' response in verses 41 to 42. My dear Martha, You are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. There's a quote by Nancy M. Eske that notices, Perhaps it is no wonder that women were the first at the cradle and last at the cross. They had never known a man like this man. There never, oh, and there never has been such another. Yes, Women loved and invested in Jesus, and he loved and invested in them too. Jesus also loves children. In John chapter 6, starting in verse 3, we read, Then then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, Where can we buy food? food for all these people. He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that with this huge crowd? But Jesus knew what the disciples did not know. There was a young child who didn't have much, but he had faith, and Jesus was ready to invest in him. I want you to go back in time now and imagine what a wedding was like in Bible times. The very first miracle that is recorded in Jesus' ministry is at a wedding that was nearing its seventh or maybe tenth day of partying. The wine had run out, And Jesus' boomer, or maybe she was a Gen X because she got married so young, (laughs) mother, thanks Pastor Jeff, who was in charge of the wedding, had a problem that needed to be solved. Who does she turn to to fix this problem? Her millennial son, Jesus, who was probably around 30. What a beautiful picture of intergenerational ministry. How many of us have to turn to someone younger to help us use our iPhones? Yes, I can hear that. I can hear. My niece, who's only six, showed me things I didn't even know my phone could do. Jesus, the living water, turns water into wine. Wine is a symbol for Jesus' blood that we celebrate through the Lord's Supper or communion. And in the Hebrew mind, the word blood equates life. So we celebrate the life Jesus lived here on the earth. And in this wedding miracle that mingles humanity with divinity, The same wine symbolizes the blood that was shed to reconcile humanity with the divinity. Jesus invested in all of us through his life and in his death and his resurrection. Why would Jesus choose to invest in people that others would consider foolish or weak? Maybe because they were available 
and were willing to learn and be used. Luke 7.30, but the Pharisees and experts in religious law rejected God's plan for them, for they had refused John's baptism. The ESV says they rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. We too are chosen and called for a purpose and must choose the principles that govern God's law, which is love. I want to share a few more testimonies before um, I continue about investing that came from my previous church. There was an older member in my church who got mad because one of his close friends was rude to me and, um, and when I had just asked him this simple favor. This was about 16 years ago. I took it in stride, but this man, who I'm not even sure believes women should be pastors, decided that from that day on, he would support me and help me with anything I needed. He only told me about this decision a year ago, and he did. He made altars for me for adventures, crosses for vacation Bible school, and various props for skits, even though I'm not sure he approves of skits all that much either. This man, who may not agree with me on various issues, is one of my favorite people and my biggest cheerleader. He would use his truck to bring big props I needed to lead the, um, the youth division at camp meeting. This man kept his promise to support me and did so up to the very time I left. Another person, Gloria, would attend another church every time I had children's church in the sanctuary. She did not understand why would we have puppets in the church. When she brought this up to me, I pulled her aside as she was leaving church one day, and I asked Gloria one question. What helps you to feel close to God? What helps you to experience him? She shared with me what meant most to her. I said, well, Gloria, puppets is how kids experience Jesus better. And she smiled and hugged me. From then on, she sat in around the third row every children's church and would compliment the worship. Before she died, I was in charge of a group of mostly young adults as we were preparing to plant another church. Gloria is about 87, just to let you know her age at this time. And Gloria would attend all the meetings she could. One day as she was leaving a meeting, she said to me, Pastor Sonia, I still don't like their music. She was referring to our target audience, youth and young adults. But, she continued, if that will help them know Jesus better, then that's okay with me. I only found out yesterday what was the backstory to that comment that she had made to me. She had been in one of our small groups as we were preparing for this church plant, and the facilitator had asked a question. He had said, what barriers are keeping you from now, right now, from being fully committed to this church plant. And she said, I had been told by some people in my church, uh, someone in the church, that I needed to be careful what, about being involved with this because um, the music would be really loud and inappropriate. And so instead of being swayed, she said, well, I guess I think I better learn what that music is. So where I came from, uh, there's a radio station called WGTS, which is the Christian radio station there. And so she would start listening to this all the time. And I always have this picture of her just sitting there listening to it all. And what she concluded was that she still didn't like the music. It wasn't for her. But she noticed that the words and the musicians who were singing those words truly loved Jesus. And so she said, right then and there, I'm all in. If this is what it's going to take to reach people, I'm all in. My church grew intergenerationally through the many years I was there. One of the most memorable times in my church was during Vacation Bible School, Sabbath, where all the youth and kids led the whole service. Travis, who taught himself to play the drums from YouTube videos, was getting ready to play the closing song. The theme that year was wilderness. But I chose to focus not just on the story that was included, but instead to make the sanctuary the central theme. I had borrowed the sanctuary props from another church and had used it as the decorations on the platform for the entire week. You can only imagine my horror when Travis ascends to the platform, picks up the Ark of the Covenant, sets it aside, and replaces it with his electric drums. 
I held my breath, pondering what this symbolism might be interpreted by the whole congregation. So what happened? No one even mentioned it, and I just smiled. Long ago, when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave, the veil of the temple tore in two. There was no longer to be any separation or barrier between us and God's presence. I've not been here long, but I already have one story that warms my heart from here. I had a conversation with a lady who was asking me why a lot of today's music is repetitive. Lines in a song seem to go on and on. I told her, have you ever heard the saying that the longest distance is between the head and the heart? Many of us have a hard time internalizing messages such as Jesus loves me. And so we have to repeat it over and over again before we believe it. In both our head and in our heart. This made sense to her and she said, no one has ever explained that to me. You should speak on that one day in a sermon. Well, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. I began my sermon about my Uncle Steve because not only is he another father figure who invested in me, but he is someone who lives his life so much like Jesus did. Remember how he was first afraid to open the loud cry mission and he was afraid that it would be too difficult to relate to those he was called to invest in? Remember how when faced with running out of coffee, he and Faith filled a coffee pot and just waited to see what God would do? This is what happened next in my Uncle Steve's own words. When we started serving the coffee from the pot, the coffee came out pure black, not watery at all. We filled the pot again to the 30 cup mark. The coffee came out black again, not watery at all. That day was the first time I ever got a compliment for my coffee. No one has complimented me on my coffee since then either. Just before supper, one of the patrons wanted to donate $5. I sent him to the store to buy more coffee. Before we added the new coffee, we added water a third time. By then, all the men had been told about the miracle. They were the ones that asked for the pot to be filled the third time. The hot water this time came out lighter than tea. The need had been supplied, and there was no more need for a miracle. Even when we seemingly have nothing to give, God can use us to reach people we couldn't even begin to relate to if we are willing to make ourselves available. I only have two final stories. This story took place early this month. This is from one of the academies in my area where a lot of my kids go, and it, it's called Spencerville. And Spencerville was playing a basketball game, and they had no chance of winning. Spencerville's uniforms are blue, so, and this will be important in a minute. Then being in the lead, the opposite team, the winning team, whose rival uniforms are in white, took that opportunity, as many teams do, when they are so far in the lead, with very little time on the clock, to put in players that rarely had the chance to play. One such player was past the ball, and he attempts a three-point shot and misses. His teammate gets the rebound and throws it back to the same player who misses the shot again. This time, my past student, who is on the Spencerville team, the team about to lose, a guy I have invested and cared for most of his life, gets the rebound. What do most players do when there is seconds on the clock and the ball ends up in their hands? You fling the ball as hard as you can across the court and hope to make a shot to pad your stats, of course. But what does my student do? Watch this clip. My kid in blue throws the ball back to the same kid in white who has missed two shots in a row. His opponent, the winning team, and the kid finally makes a shot. And then in another celebratory gesture, both his hands go up to show that the three-point shot is good. And in that moment, both teams cheer in celebration. 
You might have even seen someone from the other team goes and, and hugs him. When I saw this video, I cried tears of joy, my heart beaming in pride as if my own child had done this heroic act. I was so curious that after I texted his mom about how proud I was of him and praised her for all she had done in raising him, I texted him. This is what I wrote. I will call him Johnny. Johnny, 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 I was so very proud of you when I saw your video. I cried for 30 minutes of joy seeing how Jesus used you. Your joy after he made the shot touched my heart so much. I kept thinking, what would make you do that? And I knew it was Jesus in you. He texts back, thank you so much. I'm glad I could be used in that way, and I'm happy you were able to see it and that I could make you proud. We all miss you so much. We really do. I know I do. I appreciate you seeing that in me when most people don't. It makes me feel like I can still do things right. I responded, Johnny, you are so gifted. You are so loved, and I'm always proud of you. If you could only see yourself as I see you and God sees you, you would never doubt how amazing you are. He responded, thanks so much. I needed to hear that. Thank you for being such a blessing in our lives, even if you can't be here. Remember what I was told by my former Sabbath school leader? Don't thank me, Sonia. Invest in someone else. Today, I have so much joy to be in a church that invests in this generation. I'm so blessed that I have Pastor Barb, who has, a kin who has agreed to invest in me and to mentor me, and, and her husband, Les, who also is investing in me. What a team they are. And I'm going to continue to pour myself in as many people who are willing to let me. I always say that I'm called to disciple the youth ages 0 to 99. We all win when we are mentored and when we mentor someone else. This investment is what discipleship is all about. We are all on the same team. Everyone here in this room who's over 35 and has been part of this church for at least 10 years, please stand up. Thank you. Thank you for all you have done to invest in this church. We are where we are today because of all you have sacrificed. We need you and we love you. Look at everyone sitting down. Maybe they are newer to this church or are younger than you. You need them too. They have a lot to offer you. If you invest in them, you cannot help but be refreshed yourself. Why is it hard to fulfill this purpose that God has called us to do, to invest not only in those who are in this church, but those who are not here yet? Thank you. You may be seated. It's hard because maybe some of us have been hurt by the church or school, and maybe we feel that we have lost our voice. And so hurt people hurt people. So we're afraid to invest in others because we feel that it opens us up to rejection or failure. That's okay. It's okay to feel scared. My uncle was scared, but he chose to open the door anyway. I am asking all of us today to be willing to do the same thing today. I have one last person I want to share about, and he used to be the VP in the general conference, Ben Schoen. He was a member of my church, and he always invested me from the beginning when I got there. He was so proud of me when I had finished my doctorate that he gave me a gift. And if you ever go to my office, and I encourage all of you to please come visit, we need your help over there in that big building. There's a picture on my wall that is, looks like there's a lady dressed up in a pastoral outfit from the late 1800s, and she's surrounded by men who are also pastors. And underneath that, there's a captain that says, women are people too, only more beautiful. Why this picture is so important to me is because he used to work in the seminary. I think he was a dean there. And so he had this picture in his office in the 80s and 90s. It was his testimony for his support of women in ministry. And so I felt honored to have it in my office. Whatever barriers may be keeping you from giving the little you feel you have to Jesus or whatever is keeping you from being available to celebrate in his presence, I'm asking you to offer it all up to God. He could take your doubts, your fears, and your insecurities. We are all foolish. 
we are all weak, and that's perfect because those are the people he loves to use the most. You can trust him. He is the God who can turn five loaves and two fish into a buffet. He can turn water into wine and water into coffee. Imagine what he can do with your life and the lives that you invest in.